a hand in, in the question and answer period. We'll come to you, unmute your video, and unmute your mic, and you can ask the question to your, yourself. Or you can put your question in the chat box, and we'll ask the question for you. That makes sense? So if you all understand how that goes, we'll get right to it. Are we ready? We are ready, Ernie. Ernie, whenever you're ready. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good, good, good. Thanks, everybody, for joining us and our, our guests on, Sherry. Yes, they are, they are on. Okay, good. Thanks. We'll jump right in. This is our, our second edition of, of Cred Talks. Appreciate everyone taking the time to, to come together. I'll ask a, a series of questions to our guests, and then I'll turn it over to um, Ali, who is a man of many, many skills. I'm going to start calling him Oprah. He's doing a great, great job on Q&A, and I appreciate the help and all the thoughtfulness. So join us today. Again, we're always trying to be topical and timely and talk about what's important. Obviously, nothing's more important locally, nationally, around the planet now than COVID. Join us, and again, I just want to thank them so much. I can't even begin to imagine how busy they are for taking the time with us now. It really, really means a lot to us and to the men and women we work with. Um, Dr. Latif, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Rush University Medical Center, and Dr. Gates, who is a pulmonary disease specialist uh, here in Chicago uh, at the Feinberg School of Medicine, assistant professor there. So let me just jump right in, and I'll start with Dr. Dr. Latif. What are you seeing now that you haven't seen before? How do you even prepare for this? How are you thinking about it? There you go. Okay, thanks, uh, Mr. Duncan, and thank you all for uh, for jumping on. I know that uh, it's a it's an interesting time, and uh, I think the question specifically is what's different now with what we've seen before. You know, this is really a hundred year pandemic. Um, and when we say the word pandemic, the last time we had anything like an infectious disease like this was around 1917 with something called the Spanish flu. And at that time, we didn't have great records. About 4 million people across the world got sick. Since then, our population of the world has gone up over 20 times. And this is a disease that's just as infective and just as serious as that was then. And so we're living in a different time now where it's easier to spread. And so what we've never seen before, at least I've certainly never seen before, was the healthcare system, the hospitals, and the number of beds just getting overwhelmed in different cities in America. And fortunately, we haven't seen that in Chicago uh, for a variety of reasons because of what I would say is really great preparation on the part of our, our city and our state kind of working together to be aggressive. But we've never seen a time in this country where there's, there wasn't a place to put bodies. Um, like we are in Detroit or in New York. And we've never seen a time in this country where we have the ability to care for somebody, but we didn't have the right machine in the right place at the right time. And so we're starting to see that now, and that's new to all of us. Thank you so much. And, and Dr. Gates, if you can sort of break down very practically, what does this disease, not this disease, this virus do to the body? So this virus, like many other viruses, um, creates this inflammatory response um, that happens. And so typically the patients who have, you know, the mild symptoms just have a little bit of inflammation. It's the patients who have this robust, um, drastic inflammatory response that's causing the lungs to kind of clog up are the patients that we're hearing about and we're seeing um, in the media requiring ventilators and support in the ICU. Um, so the, the virus, the difference with this virus is that one, it is uh, transmitted much more um, frequently than the other viruses that we have seen and it's novel. So we're learning in the process of what this is actually going to do. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Latif, there's lots of uh, you know, myths out there that are frankly pretty destructive. There's a myth that young people can't really get sick there's a myth that black people can't get sick. Talk to me about what you're seeing here in Chicago and across the country, Dr. Latif. Yeah, so um, the, the first answer is that everybody can get infected. And we, you know, you've heard the word novel. 
And a lot of people, it's a fancy word. And all that means is you could replace it with new. Nobody has ever had this before. And because no one's ever had it before in the world, no human being has had this before, before November, everybody's body gets it for the first time. And anybody will, can, will be able to be infected by this disease. Anybody. And we're seeing it in Chicago affect our community here on the west side of Chicago, on the near west side. We're feeling it go out. We're feeling it hit every age group. We're having tragic outcomes from young people. And the largest number of people being transferred into this, into this hospital are from our local community. And they look in every age and they could be healthy. It's not just a disease that hits old people. Certainly they do a little worse. But it, it's, it, we've absolutely had tragic outcomes of younger people as well. So the reality is we've never had a disease in the age of social media like this. And because of that, you get the myths that you, you mentioned, Mr. Duncan. So if somebody doesn't think that they're going to have this, uh, they're wrong. And it's on Facebook, and there's a lot on Facebook that's wrong. And, and Dr. Gates will tell you that we spend a lot of time just sitting there counteracting bad information. Like I've heard recently, if you go to church, you can't get it um, because you're just far away. And I, I, I do understand why people would say that and why that feeling exists. The reality is nobody's body, because we've never had it before, we're very, it's, it's really easy to get. It's the words you'll see in the newspapers. We're all susceptible to getting it. So it doesn't take a lot and all of us can get it. Thanks so much. And Dr. Gates, if you can walk through very specifically how this disease is transmitted, how do you pass it on? Um, do you have to be sick? Do you have to be showing symptoms? You know, what does that practically mean? And, and talk a little bit about that the misinformation, because it's one thing that misinformation when it doesn't matter, it's another thing that misinformation when that bad information can kill you. Mm -hmm. So talk about, again, how this thing is transmitted and then talk about the, the you, know, how to, you know, how to figure out fact versus fiction from this because it's so, it's so serious. Right, so basically, um, the, the, the general gist is that it is transmitted through secretions, um, and particularly respiratory secretions. So a sneeze, a cough, um, anything that can make this virus kind of spread. I touch my face, I cough in my hand, then I touch a surface and you come behind me and you touch that surface. That's how this virus is transmitted. Um, and it is a virus that uh, it, we're seeing it more like when we look at the flu um, and we compare it to uh, this virus, what we're seeing is that this virus affects more people per one person infected than the flu has. And so what we need to do and why we keep saying like social distancing and good hand washing is that we need to create the space between each other that minimizes the transmission and we need to in the event that we're touching things and then touching our face um, transmitting the virus that way we need to um, take the appropriate steps so we can minimize that exposure so it's on surfaces it is you know droplet so you, you cough it kind of settles on surfaces that way as well so that's why um, we're recommending the things that we are including social distancing and very good you know, hand washing. So explain social distancing. What does that mean? Explain the benefits or not the, or the necessity or not the necessity of wearing a mask and talk about this misinformation, how we try and counter that and again, separate fact and fiction here. So uh, the social distancing means in theory, the research shows that if you're doing your kind of everyday back and forth, if you are at least six feet away from another person, you minimize the risk of transmitting the, the virus. Um, so that's what social distancing itself means. Um, as far as wearing the mask, um, a couple things. So we know that people are carriers and are not aware. So they're asymptomatic. They don't have symptoms, but they can still spread the virus. And so what the mask does is it provides another layer of protection and another layer to decrease the spread. So if you cough and you're not aware that you're sick, we can minimize what you put out into the atmosphere that could potentially be um, transmitted. Um, and so that's why we're, we're recommending um, recommending the mask and 
the social distancing. It's just more ways that we can attack from a public health um, way to minimize this, this spread. Um, as far as what's myth, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more about what you were talking about? No, just in terms of the getting good information out, countering some of the bad information on social media. How do we sort of se- how do how do you know people separate fact from fiction here? Because the stakes are so high, it's so important right now. So I think it's all about the source. So if it's a random meme on social media, it's probably not correct. If it is information from the CDC or the World Health Organization or one of the healthcare facilities. Um, in your community, then, you know, it's more likely to be correct information. I mean, I think we have to keep that in mind, is that you have to consider the source. And that's part of the problem with social media is things get propagated without understanding the source. And so we have to be diligent about understanding where things come from at this point in time. Yeah, I think, I think if I can add on to that for a second, um, Mr. Junk, you know, the when, when Kobe Bryant's helicopter crashed, the number one news source that was used the next day in the following 24 hours was YouTube, followed by TikTok, followed by Instagram. And so there, there are good links on those services, right? It's not that those are the, the, every piece of information comes from there is bad, but it's not validated. It's not tested. It's not like your school teacher was telling you that from when you were younger. It's like when a kid hears from someone who hears from someone who hears from someone. So we can't really stress enough. There's really great sources of information. Just about every hospital has a web page and on it has frequently asked questions. The World Health Organization, the Center for Disease Control, and in Chicago, the Chicago Department of Public Health has been pretty amazing, really having real ways to get answers to your questions. So when you hear something, when you're with your friends and it doesn't sound right, or it's totally different from what someone else said, Rather than argue about what you heard from where, those are the right sources to pull that information from. Uh, I'm going to stay with you for a minute, Dr. Latif. What if you if you can uh, catch this virus? If, if you get, if you become sick, what are the odds that you die? What are the odds that it kills you? What's the morbid, uh, morbidity rate? And then, if you don't die, are there any or any potential long-term impacts for you for the rest of your life? Yeah, so I want to, I think this is a great question. So a lot of people when this first was coming to the United States and nobody really saw the pictures from Italy and before it got to Detroit, it was sitting in China, right? So what you heard from a lot of different people is, hey, this is like the flu or more people die from the flu than that are gonna die from this. And it was too early to say that because this was still spreading. It's like comparing something and then how many runs a person scores in the ninth inning when you're in the second inning of a game and trying to make the same comparison. And so a lot of the stuff I'll tell you is, to, to be very honest, is this is, we are collecting information about this disease now. Like this was never in the world until November of 2019. And so we have like just a couple months of information and even that information is not clear. Like we don't know what happened in China exactly. In six months, in a year, Dr. Gates, her colleagues, they're gonna start publishing paper after paper that said 17.5% of people at this age died. 15.6% of people at this age died. What I'll tell you right now is we know that compared to the flu, you have a 10, you have a 15 times higher chance of dying if you're over 80 years old. If you're over 70 years old, it's like 10 times more. But at the end of the day, the chance of actually in Chicago, I'll just be very, very honest, and, and graphic, you know, in our hospital, about 10% of our patients are dying. Now we get transfers in from other hospitals of very sick patients. And in our ICU right now, we have 87 patients and 71 of them are on breathing machines and about 50 of them are upside down. And so that subgroup of patients tends to do worse. So the overwhelming majority, nine out of 10 people that get this are gonna be fine. Then there's around day four or five, people are developing these respiratory symptoms, you know, and then a small percentage of them get what Dr. Gates was describing, when your own body starts getting so irritated, it attacks its own self, and that causes a disease in your lungs. And that's, you know, she's the expert, you know, for treating that. And what I would say is that, that disease, that's what's killing people here. And so right now, we got about 10%. The national average is still under three. 
Got it. And yeah, Dr. Gates, if you want to elaborate on that, and again, we always just try to be very honest. So whether it's graphic or not graphic, we're very, very real. And just t tell us what this does to the body. Tell us what you're seeing. Um, tell us what the reality of this is, is like for people dealing with it and for their loved ones. So the reality is I just want to put some numbers in perspective. And so if you look at IDPH, and I honestly haven't looked um, last night, but we're in the I believe the last time I looked, 25,000 positive cases, okay? And of those, 1,000 cases have passed away. That is still a large percentage of people who got sick from this disease and recovered. And so we need to keep that in mind. I know we focus on the really bad aspects and the bad outcomes and the deaths, and we should be paying attention to that. But to put it in perspective, 25,000 people, and I'm, that's an undershoot because we're not testing the way we should be, 25,000 people have it and they're okay. They're not in that death category. And so I want us to keep that in mind. Um, but like Dr. Latif, our findings right now are about a 10% uh, mortality rate in people who are in ICU. Um, and typically what we're seeing is that there's just this huge response that is basically creating a, something that is almost like drowning. There's lots of of inflammation in cells and fluid in the lung um, that prevents the appropriate oxygen to get into the body. Um, and we have different techniques to try to, to manage that. Um, but that's essentially what we're seeing is this kind of response to the virus that basically is causing the patients to, you know, just in a, a layman's term, appear to be drowning and not be able to oxygenate, get oxygen levels in the blood appropriately. And so from that, we're seeing effects on kidneys and heart and things like that as well. So that's what we're treating when we're treating a new patient. Got it. Thank you. And there are lots of pieces to this, so we'll try and break them down carefully. And I'm far, far, far from an expert in any of this. But Dr. Latif, there are at least three pieces I'm going to focus on. One is testing. One is whether we know, you know who is sick. And there's been a tremendous lack of testing, uh, you know, not just here in Chicago, but around the country. So I want you one to talk about testing. Secondly, is, you know, are we able to treat? And if, you know, if I break my leg, I know what the treatment for that is. If I, you know, something happens, I know what the treatment of, uh, of that might be. The, the treatment here seems to be complicated or not clear. And then third, for other uh, medical challenges, there are vaccines, there are cures, and that doesn't exist yet. So if you could walk through the testing issue, the treatment issue, and then where we are or aren't yet in terms of, that, of, a, of a cure. Yeah, testing is one of the great, great uh, shows of arrogance of, of uh, healthcare in our country, and that's an opinion, but I'll explain, I'll explain that in a moment. Um, we had the benefit in the United States of not seeing this disease until after it happened in other places. And so normally you learn from, that's a whole value of studying history is so you don't make the same mistakes. Well, this happened in Wuhan in November and then we saw China figure out how to shut it down, how to figure out how to test people. We saw Taiwan and South Korea do certain things and then it hit Europe and it spread like wild and it hit Se Seattle, it spread. And then we were starting to say, man, it'd be really good if we understood how to diagnose this and make sure that we could figure it out. But I want to explain why testing is such a big deal. We had the benefit of seeing these other countries and the countries that have done well have a lot of testing and are categorizing people based on the results of the test. The areas that have not done well have dramatic spread because people who don't know that they're infected are out infecting other people. So if, if you could test everybody on this call and everybody was negative, we could have a party and everybody be fine and no one be doing anything wrong, but you would have to have their negative test, right? So if you wanted to say, how do we jumpstart the economy and get people back to work and you tested, you just took one group, was everybody who had the disease and recovered? Well, they're good, send them back to work. The other group, people that had negative tests. If you had those people out, you can get back and so, what we have right now in our hospital is the ability to test 513 people a day. I mean, that's not good when there's 3 million people in our area. Well, we have colleagues in North Shore, colleagues at, in Northwestern that each have developed their own tests. They can do 1,500, 600, 500. These numbers are nothing. 
if we really wanted to separate out our, our numbers, we would lift the restrictions of who gets a test and test everybody. And the more people you test, the more people can be cleared to get out into the workforce and know that they're safe to work. So we are woefully inadequate on testing, regardless of what you've heard. We have rules on the number of people we're gonna test in our city right now. And each of our hospitals is not testing everybody, right? And so we have to stratify. This is how we're gonna decide who to test. Yet we have to get to a point where we can test everybody. And that's what's happened in other countries. And then the results of the tests are linked to your phone. And then you show that when you get on a bus so that you're safe to get on that bus and everybody on that bus is now safe around you. That's a level we're really far from. Um, we're, we're not there, but we have to get there with testing. So every expert in the country is gonna tell you that when you can get your testing ramped up, we can start to get back to normal. To give you an idea of how long that's gonna take, because this goes into our next question about the vaccine, is we're really right now starting to release test after test, but it takes time, and the word I'll use is validate, which is check to make sure it's right. We were in such a hurry to get tests out. We have some tests that are wrong 20% of the time. We have some tests that are coming out that haven't been checked by anybody from a lab we never heard of. So we have a complicated system here of saying, how do you make sure everybody who needs a test gets a test and has a, has a good test? My feeling is we'll be there in a month. That's what our federal government is saying. Um, that's what members of the federal government are saying, that, that we can get our numbers up based on supplies. The second question you said, and I'll be more brief, is uh, treatment. Look, this has been out four months. The overwhelming number one treatment for this disease is a word I'll use, which is supportive care or supporting your body, making sure you got enough fluid in your water, making sure you got enough sort of uh, energy to fight the disease, put you in the hospital, give you things like oxygen if you're one of that it's a small percentage of people that get sick. Some different things that we do, like words that you've heard. So the magic that you've heard is something called proning. Proning means flipping a person upside down. We found that that is having an impact, but we don't even have enough numbers now since it's only been here for a couple months to see if that really made the difference between life and death. Most of us believe it would. That you've heard a lot about these magic medicines or these game changers. There's just simply put not enough out there to tell you one is better than the other. So all our institutions, mine, Dr. Gates, all our colleagues in the city, are each doing 10, 12, 15 different clinical trials for different medications, antibodies, fancy cytokines, all kinds of different things that we're putting in your body to see if it helps. But there is no single recommended smoking gun right now that's going to improve your outcomes. And the last question you said was a vaccine. It takes a, a, a making a vaccine means you study the, the, the molecule, you figure out how to trick a person's body that into having it and then develop the right response to kill it. Then you test that response to make sure that that lasts in one day, one month and one year. And then it gives you an idea of how strong that, that is. That's what a vaccine is. A vaccine is tricking your body into thinking you have the disease so that you don't actually get sick when your body develops the antibodies or a little Pac-Man that float around your body to make sure that if you have it, it'll kill it right away. So that takes at the fastest historically about a year. So what we've heard was Dr. Fauci, like he's this famous ID guy, right? Infectious disease doctor. He's this famous infectious disease doctor saying, you know what? This is at least going to be at the early part of 2022. Um, however, the little bit of good news is this particular virus is from a family and there were researchers that were studying vaccines for that family. So there's a little bit of a head start and maybe it can come out earlier than the beginning of next year. But realistically, it's not coming out tomorrow. Got it. Dr. Gates, one of the things, there's so much about this that's been so heartbreaking. One of the things that has been the hardest for me is how many you know, doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals have gotten sick. And the fact that we haven't protected you guys who are on the front lines doing this life-saving work well. And I, it's you know, probably a bad analogy, but it's like we're sending soldiers into battle without, without the protective gear they need. And um, what are you doing personally to keep yourself safe? What are you doing for your team? What's your, your own sort of stress level in maintaining your health while you try to care for everybody else? 
Mm-hmm. So first of all, thank you. Um, I, I think, and I can only speak for Northwestern, but I, our numbers as far as healthcare workers being ill are not zero, but are not very high. We have the appropriate um, protective gear. Um, and we're just making sure that we, you know, we're all in masks right now. So you walk into the hospital, you get a screen check and you get handed a health check and then you get handed a mask. And we're in masks all day if we're around each other. Um, and then if you're taking care of specific COVID patients, there's a whole nother layer of protection. Um, and so I actually feel quite protected. It is the, the biggest stress for me is my family. Um, how do I take care of these patients and keep my family safe? And so that's where, and all of us have those same concerns is what do we do um, to, to protect our families in the event that we are in contact with the COVID patient. Maybe we are asymptomatic carriers. And so that is, that is the biggest stressor that I think that we as a group here at Northwestern have struggled with because we thankfully have not seen an issue of not having protective gear. Got it. My two final questions, and I'll turn it to Ali. I'll ask you um, each both of them and then we'll, we'll open it up. Um, first question, again, let me just go to double T first. When, what's your best estimate of when we can sort of open things back up, start, stop practicing social distancing, start to get back to a little bit uh, of something that we'd consider more normal? Uh, what, what's your best estimate of when that can happen here in Chicago? So yeah, I think it's going to be first and then Dr. Gates, sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. I think it's going to be towards the end of May. And I think that the that's a, that is a complete guess based on all the models. So you you've probably all heard the phrase all the models are showing this or the models are showing that. Here's what that means. Every day there's a number of people that are infected. Someone just takes that and writes it down and then we just and then the next day another number is infected and the next day. So either that number is getting higher or it's getting higher and it levels off and then it starts to come down. Nobody could really answer the question is when do we open up again until we're on the way down. Right now, we've had four days in a row where we're right hovering around the same numbers. There's some up and down in there, but there's four days which is giving people confidence. The single problem that we have is that Illinois, or Chicago is in a bubble, Illinois is not a bubble, and the states around us are not a bubble. So even if we say that our numbers are so much better and we start to win, it, you know, in two weeks, our numbers go down dramatically as fast as they were coming up. Somebody from Detroit could just pop in to visit their cousin as a carrier and re-spread the disease in a little enclave of people that did everything right. And so what some other countries did is they stopped all that transfer. And each city in America is on a different timeline. So New Orleans had Mardi Gras. Like they had Mardi Gras. Two weeks after Mardi Gras, they had a massive increase in numbers, which is what you'd expect. So we're going to do well because in Chicago, we hunkered down earlier than other cities did. After we had our first 100 cases, we were very aggressive compared to New York or Michigan, right? So that was a testament to our, to, to our local government. But if people from other areas where it's not controlled come in, we're going to keep going up and down. I think you're going to have normality come in a couple of weeks. And not, not an, a complete opening, a slow growth back to some life, and then track the numbers. I will say this. I mentioned earlier about history. Singapore as a country did an amazing job with this. And then two days ago, after it was gone, had the highest number of increases it's ever had. So it's the same thing. Once they opened up again, the numbers shot up again. So it's going to take a while, truly, until a vaccine comes out, that life is completely back to normal. Got it. Same question for you, Dr. Gates. What's your best estimate of when we can, you know, open up a little bit? So I'm I'm with Dr. Latif. We're, we're thinking late May, June. Um, and I think I just wanted to add that we all talk about the peak, and we're hoping that the data is suggesting that we kind of hit our peak. But there's a tail, and what I'm seeing here is that we're starting to prepare for our tail, and that means that we're in this for the long haul, as Dr. Latif. Um, has suggested, and we have to keep that in mind. So we can't go back to life as it was um, before COVID, and, and we have some months into this, and we need to just be mindful of that. 
Then my, thank you. My final question, again, you guys are just extraordinary. So thank you much, so much. I'll turn it over to Ali after this. My final question is maybe less your, your medical opinion, but sort of your personal opinion. One part of this is, is the, the, the medical, you know, the illness and the, and the deaths and, and fighting to keep people alive. There's a larger question of the devastation this is having on many communities, but particularly in the African-American community, you know, financially, socially, uh, those communities that are most disadvantaged, most, most marginalized, most vulnerable, always, always get hit the hardest. And that's what we're seeing here. So beyond the lifetime or the, 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 the critical point for this virus, what do you think the longer term impact this is going to have in our communities and very specifically on our African-American communities on the south and west sides of Chicago? Yeah, I'll jump at this first. I think that this is not that you, as a country, we don't need any more proof of inequity in healthcare. Any disease that's there, you can write an article and show that there's inequity in healthcare. And it almost becomes nonsensical. Like it becomes like really a kind of stupid waste of time to say, man, there's worse, de worse deaths from breast cancer in the inner city or in a poor African American community than there is on the Gold Coast. Yet we keep writing those papers. We keep having people walk around the country presenting these same papers. Why anybody would imagine that a racial inequity would not be seen in an epidemic makes no sense. But there were people saying that early on in the course of the disease. There were people that were arguing and some of the comments on the side in the chat room were talking about how people felt like perhaps this doesn't hit the African American community. I will say this, in, in the words of Dr. Fauci, the virus chooses who it hits equally. How we respond to that or how it's spread is impacted by the communities you live in. So, so imagine if people are more likely to work in the service industry and not have a car, then they're going to go on a bus to a crowded area to work all day. So their chance of being exposed to people that have the disease is like 50 times greater than a person who goes to a single office in their own car where they'll come into close contact with nobody. So the reason it's spreading so rapidly in, 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 so low, in socioeconomic classes is the same reason other is, is one, because of the way this is transmitted. It's, trans, it's passed on when you're close to people. And it's as logical as it can be. You don't need some hot shot article to come out to say if you, if you use public transportation, you're a greater risk than if you have a car. So that, that's one sort of point. The second point I would say is access to care. There's amazing things that some hospitals can do in America when you're really sick. Like, um, so, uh, like there's a, a thing that we do where we take this machine that takes all the blood out of your body, fills it with blood, and then puts it back in, right? And that could pump blood, so it could be your heart, and it could be your lungs. So we have right now at our hospital 11 people on that machine. There's probably 50 people that would benefit in our community from being on that machine. But... Not everybody has access to that, right? And so how do you make sure that everybody has access to that? So we're taking transfers every day from our community hospitals right, for, you know, based on this. But the reality is there is inequity in this. And it's, it has to do with how you spread the disease and the environments that you're in. And then once you get it, what is your access to the highest level of care? Those are, those are highlighted like any other inequities. And it's also foolish to pretend it's not there. It's also foolish to suddenly be writing articles about this. Like two days ago in the New York Times, it came out like it was some earth shattering discovery that certain people are, are more susceptible to this. I mean, it, it's, it's insulting to a community. It highlights the ongoing inequity and racial disparities in healthcare. Uh, same question, Dr. Gates. Last question, and Ali, I'll turn it over to you. What do you see as a longer term impact on our communities on, on the south and west sides? What I'm hoping for is that we, um, as a healthcare community, start to um, really address healthcare disparities. This has been a topic of discussion since 1985. Margaret Heckler, at, in 1985, said there are healthcare disparities that are impacting the African American community. It is 2020, and we're still having the same conversation. So, as a medical community, hopefully. This will impact us, um, will cause us to do something different. As an African-American community, um, I hope that we can um, kind, of, kind of stand up for ourselves and say, make demands on 
in our community to say, this is what we need. Please help us and pro help us provide ourselves with better um, services. And so I'm hoping that there is going to be a movement um, to reducing the healthcare disparities from all of this. Otherwise, I so agree with everything. Got it. I'll leave all yours. Thank you. You know, well, in the chat, we, it's going crazy. And we got some of the <laughs> guys are, are already speaking about, uh, you know, they, they have symptoms where they haven't felt ill, but have lost their taste buds and, and sense of smell. Now, they may still be moving around throughout the day. How many people could they possibly affect by possibly having the virus, not getting checked, and not staying quarantined? So they could possibly affect many people. Um, I, the thing that I've seen going around in social media that I like to kind of um, show this idea is the burning matches. There are like thousands of matches lined up and you light it and they're so close together that the flame keeps going. If one person steps out, and so it would be the person who has minimal symptoms but doesn't go to work, the flame stops and you can't continue spreading it. So you may feel fine, but you have the ability to affect many people simply by those you come in contact with, but then you multiply that by two to three for each individual person you came in contact with. So you have this widespread from one person. And so um, we have to think in a very public health global way during this time and not just about like me and how I'm feeling, but the consequences of me going out and potentially affecting so many other people. Another question was asked, is this thing airborne? So give you an example. If, if, I'm in, if I'm in a building and you breathing in the ventilator and we share the same air, it's being circulated, is it possible I can get it from that? So the, I think the data, the, the data is uh, mixed about this, um, but there is a possibility that it's airborne. Um, and so that, again, is part of the recommendation for the masks. Um, in the hospital, we definitely treat various procedures as it being airborne, as being airborne. Um, but I think, um, I think it's better to err on the, the side that it is, um, but uh, that's where I'll leave that. Okay. We got... Uh... Rashawn Brown, he's asking the question, is it good to wipe your groceries and other items with disinfectant when you bring them into the house? Lila, you wanna take that? I say whatever makes you feel comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is good. You know, I think what's underlying this question is where does the virus live? Does it, can it live on a surface? Can it live on this table? Can it live on cardboard? Does it live on, a, my daughter was asking me if it lives on a kite. Um, you know, the reality is it does live on surfaces, right? It does. That's why washing your hands is like the most important thing you can do more than wearing a mask because overwhelmingly if it lives on a surface and you touch it and then touch your face or your eyes, you can get it. So can it live on groceries? I mean, look, it's unlikely that it's packed because the amount of time it lives on different objects, that's also very controversial. There's some people that'll say it can live on an object for four hours, other people saying it could be three days. The safe thing to do is keep washing your hands. Like there's not a study in healthcare that says to clean your watermelons with disinfectant. I would say that there's some stuff in disinfectants that are probably better for your hands than there are for the watermelon. It's probably, it's probably all safe, but you know, there's this viral video of this doctor on CNN named Sanjay, uh, Sanjay Gupta, who, who cleaned his groceries. And ever since then, our, our question and answer board is blown up with questions like that. But we are not recommending people clean their groceries. We are recommending that anytime you're touching something that afterwards you wash your hands. Okay. We got a question from Pat. How long does it take for a person 75 plus to recover when sent home after being tested positive with the virus? Yeah, I, so I, I was trying to type that answer, but I was sending my answers to the wrong people by accident, so I, I apologize. <laughs> um, you know, that's a great question. Like, so at the end of the day, everybody's body is different. So the older you are, the longer it takes to recover in general. I can't explain today why we had a 39 year old that passed away yesterday and a 91 year old that was discharged yesterday. So the level of the time it takes to recover is really variable. 
But in general, we're saying we're seeing about a week to two weeks for people's fevers to really go away for three days, to stay gone for three days. And so there's not a real answer I can tell you for the, the 75 year old, but at least a week before. And then it takes a long time to get your energy back. It's like you just got ran a marathon without any training. Your body's going to have to recover even when it doesn't have the disease anymore. Okay. I think you answered Leslie's question. Uh, she spoke about, does the body build up uh, any antibodies so you can fight off the virus? Can you answer that so everybody can possibly hear? Yeah, I think so. I, you know, uh, again, there's not, there's not proof yet because this is so new, but I would say the general belief is that once you have the disease, you're immune to getting it. How long that immunity lasts, we don't know the answer to it, but you're not gonna re-get it in a week or two. And the reason that is, is because your body builds up the antibodies to kill it, right? And they're still in your body. Now, two things can happen. The virus can change over time, or the word that you, you guys all probably know is mutate. Then you're just kind of screwed, right? Then you can, if it mutates a lot, we can all get it again. But the overwhelming belief is you will be immune to this for a long period, a longish period of time. So this question was asked by like a member of the press corps to Dr. Fauci. His answer was, I would bet my life you're immune to it, but I can't tell you how long, but probably a year. So as much of a fake answer as that is, we all believe in, in medicine that you will be immune to it for a short period of time. Apostle Carroll has a question asking, what is the danger of the country being reopened, reopened May 1st? The danger is another peak in um, infections and deaths. That's the danger. Um, if we open too early, um, we could be right back where we were three weeks ago. And so that's why we are asking people to be very cautious about opening um, completely. And that's where testing and things like that is gonna be very important so we can have some guidance as to who is safe to open up to. Okay. The brother Jamar Allison is asking a question. What are some of the symptoms that we should be aware of? So the main symptoms are fever, um, shortness of breath, and coughing. Those are the main symptoms. And those are the majority of the patients um, have those one or more of those symptoms, OK? There are reports of some people, I'm looking at the chat, just having loss of smell and loss of taste. Um, there are reports of some patients presenting with um, gastrointestinal symptoms, diarrhea. Um, if you don't feel well and you have a fever, it is possible that you have COVID and that, it, and that is the reality that we live right now. Um, and so the major symptoms, again, cough, shortness of breath, and fever, um, but anything that is mounting a response it deserves at least a call to the primary care doctor to, to talk about it, to decide what to do. Is there a way, and, and uh, Dr. Lactif, you can ask, answer this, is there a way you can tell if you had it before? Can you test to see if a person had it? Yeah, oh, so that's a, that's, that's a great question. So th there's a word you guys have seen all over the news and all over social media called serology or antibody testing. If you had the disease three weeks ago, you'll develop a, an antibody and we could check your body to see if you have that antibody. So there's this like big fight by all these smart people that do testing to see if that's working well right now. We know that it is working about 80% of the time. 80% of the time we can detect if you had the antibody, but about 20% of the time it confuses COVID-19 with the old common cold. So eventually that test that you're talking about, Mr. Ali, is the most important test to say, you're safe, man. Get out there, go live, go get back out in the world. That's called the antibody test or the serology test. We have about 5,000. We don't know who, when to start using them yet until we know if it works. Because the worst thing we can do is tell you you've had it and you have the antibodies for it. And then you get out there and start living kind of risky or doing some riskier stuff and then get the disease. So we will be able, we're going to get there, you know, but it's going to take some time for everyone to agree that that's the right test. 
And if it's only right 80% of the time, then you guys can all decide, like, how comfortable are you knowing there's a one in five chance that you don't have that antibody? So we actually have to ask you guys some myth busters. Maybe you guys can help us out. <laughs> so we hearing about the 5G towers. <laughs> and how the 5G, yeah, see, I knew the 5G towers are giving people the coronavirus. That's one myth. And then Dr. Latif, we want Dr. Gates, you can answer that since I think you know. And Dr. Latif, you can answer the myth of no, we'll come to you. Dr. Gates, go go to that one. So I have no understanding of 5G. I'm gonna say that. I I I've seen it out there. I don't I know what 5G is. I don't know the health implications of 5G. Coronavirus is not 5G. Coronavirus is a distinct entity that is taking us out. And we have to stop believing crazy stuff like 5G is causing this. And it's not. It is a virus. It is proven to be a virus. There's no, um, you know, scam or, you know, what is it called? Um, I can't think of the word right now, but it's a real conspiracy. It's a conspiracy. conspiracy. Thank you. Right. Rather than the ICU makes you go blank for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Latif, they're stating that the numbers are inflated in America. Uh, there's not that many people dying. Every everybody that's dying right now is not that it is not covert. These are, you know, the doctors are just blanking in things, making up this stuff. Can you can you speak to that myth? Yeah, well, so I listen, I don't know a I don't know a doctor that's trying to lie right now at all. I think that the tragedy right now is it there there the numbers are the numbers. So here here's the confusing part. We're not testing everybody. So there's a lot of people, many of you on the phone have had symptoms like I could see in the chat room next to us, but never mm -hmm. got a test. So maybe you had it, maybe you didn't. Right, so you wouldn't be captured in the numbers of people that have had the disease. So if in New York, you say there's 7 million people in Manhattan and, and they have like 20,000 or 200,000 people that tested positive, there may be another 100,000 that never got a test. So some of the myths that are out there are like, we're not, we're misrepresenting the number of people that are sick. It's actually not in test, intentional. We don't have the test to test everybody. Now, in terms of the number of people dying, I don't know, guys, it is impossible to hide anything good or bad from anyone nowadays. And so if you're like, so I have colleagues who are in Detroit. These people are doing God's work at Detroit Receiving Hospital, right? These are people I grew up with that are just on fire working day and night. And all that, there was a picture on CNN of this room that had bodies lined up in it, you know, and the bodies were just lined up because they were out of morgue space. I get it. So when somebody says to them, you're not telling us how many people are dying, those people they're asking have no idea how many people are dying. They're literally the ones that are sitting there taking care of people. Those numbers, they're going to come out real. Like, and because you can't hide death. That's like the one thing you can't cheat when you're counting numbers. But if you don't test somebody and they die, so this is what's happening in other countries like India. So in India, you have people showing up in the hospital really, really sick and they're just dying. And there's not enough test kits to test them. So they're saying hardly anybody's dying in India from this disease. There are people dying, they just don't have them proven to be COVID positive. So here's the truth. It's a bad disease. If you got a lot of medical problems, make sure you wash your hands. You have a chance of getting this, stay in shelter and follow the guidelines that, that we're all giving you. But it's a bad disease. If you're older, there is a high, there's a 10 to 15 percent chance of having something really bad happen. Okay, Dr. Uh, Gates, what is the best way to care for a family member with COVID-19 who are shel sheltered in place at home and alone? Um, you asked for the best way, and I recognize that this might not necessarily be the most realistic way, depending on um, living situations, but the best way is to be able to isolate that person in the home as much as possible. So a separate room, a separate area of the home, um, minimizing contact with that person. If you have to come in contact with the person wearing masks, cleaning down, you know, common spaces, making sure that 
there's good hand washing and good hygiene and other people who are not ill in the home really do have to distance themselves. For, um, and I, I'm not just giving this advice. I came in contact with the COVID positive patient. I am now living in the back of my home away from my family. So these are real life things that are, are happening that we should really use to try to minimize spread um, uh, to our family members. Dr. Latif, unfortunately, many people in our community do not have primary care doctors. What advice would you give to those that may have the COVID symptoms? This is a big deal. If you think you have the disease, there is a, a hotline number set up in the city of Chicago. There are facilities that anybody can go to right now, like McCormick, if you're not that sick and you need to get away for your family. So uh, Dr. Gates has the opportunity to stay away from her family, but still be close. But not everybody has the ability to do that. So if you have symptoms and don't have a primary care doctor, Call the COVID hotline for the city of Chicago, but we're going to pump out that number. Call any one of the hospitals and then come get a test. After that, the city of Chicago can give you resources of places to stay right now where you can get away from your family and not risk infecting other people. The other, the other reason why that's important is if you think you have symptoms, I don't know anything in healthcare where waiting to get help gives you a better outcome. So simply just calling somebody, running through your symptoms, getting keep, keeping track of you is a good thing. There's a, I'm gonna write this chat line number for everybody. So if you think you have symptoms, you call this number and uh, they'll, they'll be able to organize a plan and a place for you to stay. And I'll also send you my number. Dr. Latif, I have a quick question. I've been wanting to ask someone this. Is, so I know that there are resources out there to allow people to move away from their families. Is there a cost associated with this? No, the, the, that's a good question, Khalil. The, the, the McCormick Center right now is free, but it opened yesterday and, and the city is working on getting messaging out for how people access that. And so I've been on the phone with, with colleagues of yours, with Gary, um, Dr. Noskin, and we're trying to sort out how to best get that word out. But for you guys on the phone, there, there are places to go to get you away from other people so you're not worried about infecting them. And, and, and we'll help you get there. That's tragic. If you live around old people and you feel like you have symptoms, man, call that number and get out of there and we'll figure out how to get you sorted out. Okay. Some of our staff were considered uh, essential workers. How do we best adhere to a shelter in place practice order to keep our families and coworkers safe? This is Dr. Gates's life right now. <laughs> <laughs> it so, is. Yeah. Um, I think it is an individual um, decision talking to people in the household, what, is, what are you gonna be comfortable with? Um, a lot of my colleagues have either isolated themselves into different parts of the home and some have left the home completely or sent family away to other family members. And so there is no easy solution. There is no guidance at all to this. Um, it really is what's going to work for the individual worker. I, I will say this, and, and may perhaps um, uh, I can connect with you offline, um, uh, Mr. Ali. There, there, the city of Chicago is working hard to find alternative solutions for essential workers that aren't comfortable going home. There's various hotels that have, have, have worked with the city that are free of charge. Um, those are some of the challenges they're going through and perhaps we can connect offline so that your audience, everybody on this call can have access to those. Because if, if you have a good medium to get the word out, that would probably be helpful for, for the city and for people who are essential workers. Because yeah, we should figure that out. Yeah, and I just want to add that like, yeah, there are resources. So last night when I got the, um, the information that the patient was COVID positive, yeah, I had resources. I, I could go to a hotel, but then the question becomes home and how do, you know, children and, and what's the best way to like not disrupt her life and the rest of the family. So again, that's where it becomes, it, you, you really, it's an individual, resources are there, but it has to be like a, a group kind of decision on what's best for that unit. Quick question. So this thing originally started in China. And China has less than 23,000 cases. Um, I mean, excuse me, 
683,000 cases. America is almost at 650,000 yeah. cases. In a matter of less than 60 days, we went from 324 cases reported to 600,000 and 600,500 cases reported. How, how, does, how can we contain that number? And what is China doing differently than what we're doing? Where in the, in the, the countries under us, if we're 600,000, the country under us, is, I think is Spain, and they're at 170,000. What, what is the difference from Spain and America that's making us, making this thing spread so rapidly here versus there? I wish, I wish, uh, I wish, Mr. Ali, we were in a room so I can read the faces of people when I say this. We are, uh, we are pretty, um, we don't like to be last in anything in America, right? So we had Mardi Gras, right? Like you want to know why we had, when the disease was spreading and the federal government said don't hang out in bigger groups of 10 people, we thought it was a good idea to party with thousands in the street and as close as we can. Two weeks later, New Orleans ran out of hospital beds. This is a pretty simple concept, right? If we stay in shelter, the disease will slow down. If we take people who are infected and say, we're gonna go on spring break on the beach of Florida, we will spread the disease. We had active people saying the cure for the disease is worse than the disease itself. So here's what people are saying. So th that is not being said in Korea, right? They're saying, if you have symptoms, you are not only not allowed out of your house, you're tracked. If you walk out of the house, you're forced back. You want to know what happens in Wuhan? You're not allowed to leave. There's a border around Wuhan. And if you want to leave, you have to take a QVR code on your phone. And it shows that you've been tested. This is your potential serology. Or you've been infected and you've gone out of it. Then you're allowed to leave. And those are the truck drivers. But they've contained it and they stopped the spread. So what we in America, what's happening is we are yesterday, day before yesterday, People in the state of Michigan, where people are dying in Detroit, other people went to the capital of Michigan and said, you're restricting our rights. We should be allowed out of the house, right? So, you know, so here's the, the answer to why does the United States have so many more patients? We are not staying in sheltering. Every other country, even Italy, realized they made a mistake. The lieutenant governor of Louisiana said, apologized, right, to the mayor of New Orleans for saying these things, yet there are still people in this country that insist that we, it's, we have to reopen the economy, we have to reopen the country. That's a different ar argument, but you wanna know why are our numbers so much higher? Our numbers are so much higher because there are still eight states today that have no difference in rules, and two of them are very close to Chicago. That's Nebraska and Iowa. And so there is spread and it's increasing in those states. It, it's what Dr. Fauci said, the virus is going to decide when it's time to open the country. Not us, not a politician, not some nonsensical kind of bullshit story that someone tells you. This, oh, sorry, this is going to be real um, when we uh, accept that you have to stay home until the virus dies. Okay. We're asking this question. So what do you guys think about, is there a possibility for pandemic two? Is there, a is there a possibility for this thing to uprise and not go away? Yes, that's why we are, I guess the question is, what do you mean by pandemic two? If you mean like this goes away and then pops back up, that's what we're worried about. That's what we're planning for. If we don't have a strategic approach to opening it, the society back up, we can see little bumps and we are preparing for that. Um, and so, again, I think, I, I hope you've heard that from both of us. We have to have a strategic way to open us back up so that we can avoid the, the, the peaks again. Okay. I think someone is, they're making stick up. Potential war tactics. I don't even know what that means. I mean, I know what it means. <laughs> do you think like the conspiracies out there you know you got world star you got facebook you got instagram so this is the question that you'll get on the regular basis these are the questions that's asked in our population that's spreading around from war taxes to 5g towers to 
you know, all everything, you know, the, this is made up, this is not right. And then, you, I mean, does lemon juice work? Is it all kind of things? That, I mean, it's out here and we just ask you guys to kind of give us the clarity around it. And I know it's more difficult than not to kind right. of right. give us clarity to it. I mean, I'm, I, I, hopefully all of you all can walk away from this hearing that this is not a conspiracy. This is not any hotepness. This is real life. There's a virus and it's killing us. And as a community, we have to give up all that other conspiracy stuff and get real about this so that we can protect ourselves, our families. I mean, this is real. And I'm part of your community. I'm not lying to you. Like, this is real. We're on the front lines fighting this. I can tell you this is real. Thank you, guys. Thank you to Dr. Gates and Dr. Latif. Um, you guys are heroes. And I just want to thank you guys for fighting for all of us every single day. You're absolutely on the front lines. Please thank your, your staff. Please thank your colleagues. And please thank your families. And your families are making real sacrifices to allow you to do this, this you know, life-saving work every single day. So um, our whole work is focused on reducing gun violence. We're trying to save lives every day. You guys are doing that every single day as well. So just you know, from the bottom of my heart, for my family, I uh, just want to you know how much I appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time. Again, I can't begin to imagine what your schedules are like this, these days and all the different demands. So for our, for our community, for our men and women, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, thanks to everybody for thoughtful questions. Ali, great job on the moderating. And then finally, our next credit talk will be uh, on April 30th. Uh, so thanks so much, everybody. Stay safe, stay inside. As you heard, this is not a joke. This is not a conspiracy. We have to protect each other. We have to look out for each other now more than ever. Thank you so much, guys. Thank, Thank you. you.